Um, in, in South Asia, as uh, no doubt in many other places, there's quite a significant, I would say, divide between uh, text-based environmental history uh, and historical, or maybe if you prefer, scientific work in, pale, uh, in paleoecology and in archaeology that's uh, based on material remains. And uh, perhaps as a, a consequence of this, I think the very significant uh, regional and temporal diversity of forest history on the subcontinent, just echoing what Mike just said, um, is often not fully appreciated, and we get instead a kind of picture of a rather stable, uniform, pre-colonial landscape that's only been uh, moderately affected by human uh, land use, and that's rather too common. So, for example, a very a recent surge of really excellent historical research on colonial forestry in India has spawned, I would say, surprisingly little corresponding work on the pre-colonial history of Indian forests. Now, certainly the nature of the pre-colonial textual evidence provides some pretty significant challenges to doing this, but as I hope we're going to demonstrate today, these challenges, I think, are far from insurmountable, um, and we'll argue in particular, maybe preaching to the choir with this group, for um, the inter de development of integrated research programs and perspectives that combine work from across a range of disciplines, from history and art history to archaeology, uh, ecology, and geology. So let's begin um, then with a kind of small puzzle, or maybe really a contradiction. And that is for at least the last thousand years, and maybe longer, South Indian textual representations um, have really celebrated places of cultural value on the landscape. And two of the most prominent of these are irrigated fields on the one hand, and forests on the other. So let's start with forests. Uh, forests in Indian literature are often literally places apart. That is, they're very clearly distinguished from ordinary locations of human um, uh, residence and use. Forests are often home to religious figures and may operate as places of transition or of refuge for non-forest dwellers, as illustrated, by, uh, for example, by the scene from the Ramayana epic, um, Exile in the Forest. F forests, too, uh, were seen to contain, and still do, seem to contain differently organized kinds of peoples. Peoples even today often distinguish as tribals, uh, a term sometimes used in contradistinction to caste society. Now, when, while many of these tribals, these forest denizens, they served in pre-colonial armies and also worked as trackers, as hunters, and traders, uh, growing and or collecting various kinds of forest commodities, uh, forests were also, also, as in European traditions, seen as potential lairs of bandits and other kinds of criminals. Uh, later, British rulers would even uh, classify entire ethnic groups as so-called criminal tribes, uh, codifying this prejudice directly into census categories. So danger and difference are the inverse, perhaps, of forest associations with holiness and separation from the corruptions of civilization. So although tribals have never had a high status, forests in South Asia also served as um, reserve locations for elite sport, and I think we're going to hear more about this later in the conference, especially royal hunting. And the strategic value of dense forests also was widely recognized um, historically. So the Amukta Malayata, for example, which is a poem attributed to the 16th century Vijayanagara king, Krishna Devaraya, argues on the one hand both for the importance of clearing forests within one's kingdom and also of maintaining dense forests around the perimeter as a um, kind of defensive or security measure. Similarly, irrigated fields, and especially rice paddies, uh, figure prominently in both literary works and also in the really more sober kind of workaday texts that describe tax donations, um, uh, religious gifts, and other transactions that were often inscribed into stone or copper plate and make up a big part of the historical record of South Asia. So it would be easy to imagine from all of this textual representation then that South A Indian landscapes between about AD 1000 and 1700 consisted primarily of lush green paddy fields set within dense forests of abundant game. So the contradiction or the puzzle I say here of course is that actual landscapes of southern India um, did not consistently or really even mostly reflect these culturally valorized images. And in the driest parts of the peninsula, irrigated fields and forests were, as we found, already quite minor components of the landscape by about AD 1000, um, notwithstanding their uh, cultural significance. And in this part of the dry interior, irrigated land was highly restricted, 
um, despite tremendous efforts exerted in the, on the construction of canals, aqueducts, and reservoirs. But in spite of their limited extent, these pockets of irrigated land were extremely important in facilitating the existence of large-scale settlement in these dry zones. And this is, was an accomplishment, if you want to think of it that way, that resulted in a long and sustained, though not precisely unidirectional, uh, decline in the tropical dry deciduous forests of the interior. So a quick um, backup for a minute, uh, a little orientation for those who are less familiar with the region, um, and a quick orientation to the geography of the peninsula, that is of southern India. Uh, what we can see in South India is that rainfall and topography are the two most critical factors structuring local environments. Um, rainfall is not only highly seasonal, but it is also, can, as you can see from this map, um, its distribution is very significantly modified by orographic effects. The Western Ghat mountain chain runs right along the southwestern coast of India, more or less, just a little bit inland, um, and it's, it, it's visible quite clearly by the, the blue section of higher rainfall. The Bellari weather station, I don't know if you can read that in the center, um, is the closest to the interior region where we've studied most closely. This is an area contained within that kind of yellow teardrop shaped patch um, with a mean annual rainfall between about 25 and 50 centimeters. So it's striking then, but perhaps you know, hardly surprising that the drier interior um, has been significant, quite significantly deforested while the upland areas of the Western Ghat Mountains retain the largest expanses of forested areas in South India. Um, estimates of India's forest zone, uh, obviously highly contested, it depends a lot on what you mean by that, but they range of something around 19% of the total uh, land area of the country. Of this, uh, again, Greenpeace labels 5.8% as intact, whatever that means exactly, uh, Chaturvedi similarly defines about 45% of Indian forests as being secondary, and this is a definition that would certainly include all of the dry deciduous forests of the interior. So I think we'll see where we're going with this in a minute. So uh, a kind of hypothetical vegetation transect then, let's say, from the west coast to our study area, this is the area I want us to focus on, um, our study area in the semi-arid interior would take us on the west from wet evergreen forests through moist deciduous forests and down into dry deciduous forests and scrubland bordering in the east on dry evergreen formations. So now, while the distances between these areas are quite consequential, I mean, India is a very big country. This is maybe not as big as the Amazon, but it's, this is a long distance. We want to make the point that um, these diverse regions from west to east have actually been very closely linked through human land use practices for several thousand years. So as, and as we have found, we'd like to stress today, changes in both ritual practice and food preference have had quite significant effects, not only on the areas of high population density in the semi-arid lowlands, but also on the apparently remote uh, forests of the upland Ghats. So if we can just briefly then think about some of the, um, what I'm calling received views or um, more flippantly truisms of Indian environmental history uh, in light of this textural, val textural valorization of irrigated fields and of forests, I think we can begin to see perhaps where some of the idea of a kind of um, great pre-colonial sustainability program in South Asia um, emerged. That is, the historical association of forests with religious ascetics, for example, moves quite easily, really, into the idea of indigenous relationships with nature as being essentially spiritual in some sense. Um, but what's somewhat more disturbing to me, really, is the common assumption that textual references alone constitute <coughs> adequate evidence for the existence of very extensive pre-colonial forest tracts. Um, and indeed, uh, our use of the term truisms in this slide should suggest to you one of the major points of the talk in the sense that none of these assertions are, in fact, true. Okay. So to move beyond this state of play, then, in terms of, of South Asian environmental history, I think there's, we need to um, uh, create or uh, destroy, let's say, two kinds of intellectual barriers. The first is the established separation of agrarian studies from forest studies um, in South Asia, a separation I think that needs to be quite significantly uh, eroded. But even more, um, secondly, and even more critically, I think, it, it would seem quite important in light of this to be able to assess the histories of vegetation and human land use independently of past cultural representations. 
And this is something, obviously, that material evidence can um, certainly provide. So to this end, um, we and our colleagues have been um, conducting a, a long-term program of um, archaeological, paleoecological, and historical research in the interior, um, tracking changes in land use, vegetation, and geomorphology over about the last 4,000 years or so. Uh, unfortunately, fully comparable data from other regions are really lacking, but we've also been able to draw out some larger scale comparisons um, using existing research, especially from the West Coast and Western Ghats, the area of that vegetation transect that I just showed you. So here really, in a nutshell, you can ignore the rest of my talk because these are the main points in this slide, um, are our, our main points. So first of all, um, on, in the interior, we say that the dry deciduous forests of the interior of southern India have developed in concert with human land use for more than 70,000 years, kind of a long time, um, with the last 5,000 years or so seeing the most significant human impact since the development of agriculture, not surprisingly. Um, here, the expansion of rice agriculture and irrigation in particular has had a major impact on soils and vegetation in the interior. And this agricultural practice has been responsive not only to changes in population, which is very important, but also to evolving food preferences, something I'll have more to say about in a minute. On the other hand, the upland and coastal forests of the Ghats and the West Coast have a much shorter history of human occupation, only about 2,000 years. So these upland, which is still you know, fairly significant, but these upland forests, while they have um, for a long time and, and still do supported some subsistence regimes, on the other hand, have also always been part of exchange networks. Okay. And the same kinds of culinary and ritual demands for upland forest products uh, or culinary ritual demands that structured lowland irrigation regimes also um, made certain kinds of demands on upland forests, and these have transformed local environments and social organization in the uh, more humid uplands in quite significant ways. And then finally, for at least the last 2,000 years, both upland and lowland landscapes have been connected to one another and both um, to larger contexts. That's the, where we're headed. So much, much too quickly, quickly then, what we're going to try and do is just very broadly sketch out some patterns of change, changes in forests and fields um, from about AD 1000 till now, um, with a focus on our study area, area in the interior, but also keeping the western uplands in mind as a kind of um, important contrast. And today we'll just stress two factors that have had a, quite a significant impact on regional environments. First the history of population distributions on the landscape, especially the development of large urban centers. And secondly, um, emerging so social differentiation that was manifest in terms of diverging forms of consumption, something certainly very germane to contemporary um, concerns about rising food prices in the world right now. So let's look at that second point about consumption first. Uh, so during the first couple of centuries AD or so, and we're still working on the timing of this, South India saw the development of a, quite a sharp differentiation in consumption practices, a difference that's still evident today. That is, during these centuries, there was a kind of slow codification of several regionally differentiated but elated, related elite cuisines, um, all based on irrigated produce, um, especially rice. Now, except in very moist environments, virtually all of the critical components of this cuisine require artificial irrigation, uh, which makes the raw materials of these meals, which are offered to gods as well as consumed by elite human beings, um, extremely capital and labor intensive, and also meant that they were out of reach for much, perhaps most, of the population. Um, elite meals and expanded temple-based rituals um, also required various kinds of spices and aromatics, many, a great many of which derive from the more humid upland uh, forests. And in addition to plant foods, um, dairy products such as yogurt and ghee, a dairy-based uh, dairy um, oil, were critical elements of this elite meal, and both of these, of course, of course, are associated with grazing animals, and particularly cows. So on the left side, then, I mean, foods of the poor, conversely, uh, were and are very dry. So an adjective that can also describe the major form of cropping, which is solely rain-fed. So consumption, in this case, is built around a variety of hardy millets and legumes. And oils, too, are much more commonly derived from oil seeds, such as sesame and castor, uh, rather than coconut, not something else requiring irrigation, or animal-based products. 
Okay, so these diverse consumption practices were reflected in a mosaic of forms of uh, agricultural production from rain-fed farming to grazing to extensive, intensive irrigated agriculture. And these diverse forms of production, of course, had um, varied environmental effects. Permanently irrigated fields are associated with things like the development of paddy soils, um, the extension of disease vectors such as mosquitoes, and of course transformed uh, flora and fauna. Dry farming and grazing too were quite consequential and one of the most visible historical consequences is uh, soil erosion. Okay, so we, we should ask then I think this, and that is how did the development of an elite cuisine affect South Indian landscapes? Uh, while well, rice and very other highly productive crops uh, in this region themselves created the possibility for large aggregated settlements in dry regions, the elite meal or the development of the elite meal relied on extensive grazing land almost as much as on canals and reservoirs. Thus, a large cities imply not only zones of irrigation for the support um, of the well-to-do, but also dry farming zones for the support of poor citizens and extensive grazing areas for everybody. So if the presence of large cities in the dry interior sounds like a kind of recipe for ecological degradation, or at least, let's say, transformation, if you want, in many effects, you know, it was. But one, I think, surprising and interesting part of the history of human environment interaction in this area is what happens when, or what happened, actually, when de-urbanization took place in the context of an already established irrigation network, something that would, of course, not have happened without the prior exist history of investment aimed at supporting an urban elite. This particular historical conjuncture allowed, however briefly perhaps, a, a very interesting resurgence in the dry deciduous uh, forest cover of the dry interior, a kind of a, a blip in what seems to be a longer history of forest loss. And what this suggests is, of course, that this kind of change is certainly at least possible and for that reason alone, it might be worth looking at a little bit more closely. And besides, Susanna wanted me to. So let's look a little bit more specifically. Um, much of our work in the interior comes from the area around the city of Vijayanagara, which was a great imperial capital, we say whose rather improbable 300-year history in the middle of one of India's driest regions represents, on the one hand, a, a kind of extreme manifestation of both human ingenuity and of environmental transformation. I won't tell you a lot about the project, um, but we've studied the quite dramatic impact of this city on the regional environment, tracking changes in agricultural production across the three centuries of urban occupation and beyond, till the present really. Um, by the early 16th century, when the city was home to several hundred thousand people, it was a very, very large place, um, problems of erosion and reservoir sedimentation were already quite severe. And here's a, just a few pictures of you know, reservoir sluices buried in three meters of sediment and so on. And we've documented these kinds of effects not only archaeologically, but also uh, using pollen analysis from some of the reservoirs that were constructed during this time, as well as an ongoing work on one constructed much earlier. And in this picture you see uh, many years ago, Mark Lysett and I uh, taking a core from the 14th century Kamalapuram Reservoir, uh, which represents a very large-scale regional pollen record, including material derived from the iron-rich Sondor Hills in the distance, about which you know, you'll hear more in just a minute. Most people don't like looking at pollen diagrams, so you'll be really happy to see here that I, I'm not going to talk about this record in, in um, great detail, except to say that uh, I'm giving you a, a kind of single composite diagram showing changes in major categories of plants between about the 14th century and the 20th century. The base of the sequence is in the early 14th century. The top of the sequence is in the late 20th century. And what we see is um, a loss of woody vegetation during the early 14th century as this massive city um, was, ex was um, founded and grew on the landscape. And interestingly, a rebound in trees and shrubs following the abandonment of the city in the late 1500s. That rebound is, is clear, most clearly evident with that orange arrow, second one down from the top. So what does this rebound look like? Um, some of it's clearly caused by the expansion, maybe even unintentional, um, of previously cultivated taxa like phoenix or date palms, while some of it is uh, apparently a rebound in the woody vegetation of the nearby Sandor Hills. 
These, these hills, the Sondor Hills, are a kind of small island of more mesic vegetation, uh, similar to that of the Western Ghat foothills that are just south of the city of Vijinagar, the now abandoned, right? The Sondors, as we have learned from our, our research, were in fact actually much more, sparsely popula uh, much more sparsely forested in the 16th century than they are today. That in itself, I mean, it's, I think, fairly remarkable. Um, the Sondor forests rebounded quite significantly after the fall of the city, and by the early 19th century, documents suggest that the hills supported large animals, um, such as tigers. However, by the late 19th century, mining and logging were already prompting renewed deforestation. And um, over the last 20 years, since we've been working there, we say that the expansion of uh, mining, the expanded mining of iron and manganese ore appears to be making any further rebound unlikely as the hills are literally being blown apart um, each day. And particularly in the last few years since the um, massive expansion of iron production for the Chinese market for the Olympics. Um, in the last couple of years. Okay, so, but, but this post-urban forest regeneration is, oh, one minute, okay, appears, however, to be uh, quite localized. I am almost finished. Restricted, uh, perhaps, to the moister Sondor Hills. And this is evident from this Caribacale pollen uh, re reservoir sequence, which covers the last thousand years, a much longer period. And here we can see that the period of dense urban occupation inside the red lines um, led not only to a never, never um, reverse decline in tree cover, but also to a near total loss of woody climbers, which is evidence perhaps of the consistent pressure of burning, grazing, and wood collection on the dry granitic hills. Okay, I've got one minute to do the rest of the subcontinent, but I think I can do it. Okay, so finally moving west to the more, uh, the more humid got forests, here we have, as I said, no, no significant evidence for um, any kind of serious large-scale human occupation until the first century AD, when we first find archaeological sites as well as pollen evidence for forest clearing. This period, the first century AD, saw the existence of large-scale trade in forest products across the Indian Ocean. Um, and of this trade, many products, many were cultivated, but many, including pepper, which is the most important, were gathered wild. In, in return, lowland products such as rice and manufactured goods moved up into the forest. So within the peninsula, the very consistent demand for spices, aromatics, and other kinds of forest products for elite cuisine, as well as the flow of rice and manufactured goods in the other direction, uh, say, ensured the integration of upland forests and forest dwellers into these lowland economies and ecologies. And the expansion of the um, trade in forest products, or something to think of as the spice trade, in the 16th and 17th centuries, including the entrance of European trading companies, led to an increased demand for forest products and also for rice, um, the rice to feed growing coastal cities and also to exchange for forest products with um, what were becoming increasingly specialized uh, forager traders. Right? As, as these special, specialist adaptations developed, um, many people who were previously more generalized agriculturalists practicing various kinds of you know, Sweden agriculture dropped those strategies, and we have concomitant changes in forest vegetation. So these centuries um, saw the development of so-called tribal groups, um, occupational specialists who were really memorably dubbed by one anthropologist professional primitives. Right? So by the time British rule was established in this region then, um, the Ghat forests had been integrated into regional and inter international networks of power and exchange for more than 700 years. Um, and despite their colonial and more recent uh, reputation as sort of pristine forests home to unchanging aboriginal populations, um, quite the contrary, you say that the, the historical development of specialized forager traders out of more generalized agriculturalists led on the one hand not only to their ethnographic invention as timeless yet noble savages, but also to a view of the upland forests themselves as somehow out of, apart from human history um, that had otherwise despoiled the rest of the peninsula. Forest history on the one hand, agricultural history on the other. And these kinds of perspectives, say, resonated powerfully with existing Indian views of forests as places apart, right? A kind of convergence of views, I think, of the conservationists, of traditional literature, and so on, um, that perhaps, I think, makes some of the misconceptions of contemporary environmental history um, in India more explicable. Okay, I'm on this last slide. All right, so while the physical impact of human history on the Ghat forest was not nearly as dramatic as the thousands of years of human action on the tropical dry forest of the interior, 
Upland forests, too, I would say, were critical players in a kind of culturally specific ecology of food production and consumption that stretched all the way across the peninsula, from the humid tropics to the semi-arid interior. Um, and in southern India, say, this kind of elite diet of gods and humans that emerged during the last thousand years, it represents, if not a complete ecological anomaly, as it does in the very dry parts of the subcontinent, um, then at least a very highly socialized kind of products that requires, on the one hand, upland forest products, labor-intensive irrigated produce, and the network of connections um, that link to them. So to a, to, uh, to a large extent, I would say, then the, the history of southern India's tropical dry deciduous forest is, is almost totally submerged within what's usually thought of, and, and I, I did too, probably, as agrarian history, while on the more humid Ghat forests have been accommodated more easily into recent forest histories, um, in large part because of their differential histories of um, human land use. In both cases, though, of course, there's, a, I think, an urgent need to integrate, on the one hand, cultural and political accounts with environmental and paleoecological ones, particularly in light of the very real difficulties inherent in relying on what I think of as quite interested accounts of the extent and distributions of forests in the past, and indeed of irrigated fields um, as well. So I will cut off the last paragraph here. Okay. Go ahead. Because wow. time up. Time, time. I did practice. It was exactly 20 minutes when I practiced. But, well, but you know, then you change your speed and so on. Uh, you went a little over, Kathy. <laughs> All I right. I'll say. never say a mean thing to anyone again. OK, questions, comments? Tom Rudell, uh, Rutgers. Um, Kathy, some questions about what happened in the 16th century in the dry forests. You mentioned in there de-urbanization. Does this mean um, uh, dispersion of the population throughout the region, including maybe into the Ghats and connected with the globalization, or does it mean depopulation? And um, it doesn't mean depopulation. I mean, I mean depopulation usually means people move for the most part. I mean, except for a few specific kinds of cases like you know European colonization. Well, that was a big, big thing, right? But in the the history of this particular region is one of you know really large scale population transformation. So in the 14th century, you get the development of a really huge city in a place that had been quite sparsely populated before. So obviously, it's people moving in from various other kinds of places. In the late 16th century, when the city was um, abandoned as an urban place. I mean, we know exactly why. There was a battle, and the place was looted and sacked, and so on. So what happened was that the elite component of the, uh, 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 and the sort of urban part of the population shifted to further south in the empire. But the small agricultural villages all around the ancient city continued to be occupied. So what happened was that there was a, a, a large scale shift in the nature of land use practices. And in fact, some people, at least oral his, some people's oral history suggests that some groups fled up into the Western Ghats in the 16th century, you know, to get away from, you know, the political following political upheaval. Uh, so the, the population you know, transformations are stark you know, and abrupt, more so perhaps than a lot of other region. But what's so, so interesting is that, you know, that that historical conjuncture left behind this very well-developed irrigation infrastructure. And so our, what we see archaeologically is that you know, there's, a kind of, there's a mosaic of kinds of practices. There's canals and aqueducts and other sorts of things that support permanent irrigated wet rice agriculture. Then there are reservoirs, like that big one I showed that's completely abandoned, right? And um, you know, gravel mulch fields and check dams, and all kinds of small scale things, supporting you know, uh, dry farming and grazing. All of the dry farming and extensive components of the um, agricultural regime drop out immediately as soon as the city is abandoned. And people just contract in to the very intensive, very localized kind of um, agricultural situation. So in some ways, it's not so dissimilar to, for example, the industrialization of agriculture in North America, in which you, know, you get a, a much uh, more intensive land use regime, but in much smaller area. Right? And there, the effect is, in some ways, quite similar, um, that there's a kind of resurgence in woody vegetation. But that picture of resurgence, I mean, it's, a, it's a, you know, obviously, it's contextually specific, depending on um, the distinct possibilities of different sets of you know, plants and soils and so on. I don't know if that answers it. But. 
David Lentz, University of Cincinnati. Um, uh, in your excavations at Vijayanagara, uh, were you able to look at the middens of the elites and non-elites and, and see this, the pattern of uh, elite food items uh, appearing on a regular basis? Uh, was that statistical or was it absolute or how did that appear? That is um, a good question and I wish I could say, you know, that we knew exactly. But what we have not really yet had the opportunity to do is to get a lot of direct evidence of consumption um, from the city itself. So in our new project, actually what we've done is our, we're moving back in time and uh, really looking at the last several thousand years because I'm very interested in then is when exactly does rice agriculture get established as a kind of dominant strategy in these dry parts of southern India? Um, how is that, or is it, associated with emergent social differentiation, if we think, around 500 BC or so? We were working on the details. And um, it, is the differentiation sort of millets versus rice, the wet, dry thing, does that part of, you know, um, changing is that part of you know uh, a different social different different and status differentiation right from the beginning of South Indian um, production and, and um, sort of food regimes, or is it something that emerges quite a bit later? Right now, we think it emerges later, but we don't know when exactly, and we don't know you know how widespread these things things are. I mean, we know that there's this stark differentiation um, in consumption and in the kind of productive regime that produces it, but the the details are something that we're now working on with our new project, so. I'm Monica Janowski, University of Sussex. Um, this kind of follows on from that because um, in relation to elite and uh, poor foods, what you're suggesting happened when the city collapsed seems to imply that whereas previously there was a differentiation uh, after the city collapsed, um, everybody began to rely on the irrigated core so that the poorer people who had previously eaten low status millets began to eat rice. That, that's a fairly um, a big change. I, I wondered if, if you could comment on that, and, and particularly whether you've um, explored this um, through some uh, sort of ethnographic discussion with, with people now about the implications of that. Uh, and you didn't say whether people are growing millets at all now and what kind of status they have. Perhaps you might contextualize that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we don't, you know, we know that it's similar to the, you know, question David just asked, right? Because we know that there's this contraction and we can see the changes in vegetation. But do we know what exactly they're growing, you know, in the um, late 16th century, early, we don't actually know. I mean, we know that they're still using the irrigated areas and that certain kinds of dry um, facilities have fallen out of use, right? Uh, uh, pe there is still, that differentiation is still very much evident, right? And there's been, you know, a slow, since the abandonment of the city, there's been a reorganization of regional population and, and growth of population. So now, I mean, there are still quite extensive areas of dry farming and, you know, millet growing and, and most people uh, want rice but don't really have large uh, scale access to it. What happened particularly in the 19th century under colonialism and with the expansion of the railroads into the area was a shift in the um, production of the irrigated zones towards certain kinds of commercial crops. Right? I mean, it's not as though that it was a kind of great, a grand subsistence regime in a city of three or four hundred thousand people, right? It was a commercial production, um, agricultural production at the time of urban occupation as well. But by the 19th century, and par probably a little bit earlier, those irrigated zones are not producing rice for human consumption. They're producing primarily sugar cane. Right? And this is something that we've also tracked, I think, in the, in the paleobotanical record, because we've been looking at charcoal history and the sizes and distributions of charcoal particles in the reservoir, and as, long as, and, and as well as the historical documents. And I think we see there a shift towards sugar cane production and the sort of you know poor people are back out growing millets again. Whether or not they you know had their chance, you know when all the rich folks left and they're like, yeah, you know the canals are ours, um, we can eat rice for a while. That I don't know the answer to exactly. Yeah. Peter Crane, University of Chicago. Just a very obvious question, Kathy, and that is, um, and one that was perhaps relevant to some of the debates we were having after the previous talk, and that is. Uh, I think one of the reasons that ecologists now are, are kind of 
getting used to the idea of, of human impact on a global scale is climate change. And the question is, what happened to the climate um, during this critical interval that we would call the Little Ice Age uh, in this part of the world, which surely had an impact in your area too? I would love to know the answer to that. And we, uh, you know, I've, I don't have any particular direct evidence for that. And I've, you know, read, every, you, maybe you, someone here can help me know, I've read every ecological, paleoecological study, and nobody agrees exactly, you know, what the specific effects of, you know, uh, you know, uh, greater rainfall, you know, what, what exactly is going on in, in that part of the world. So, so from what we know, I mean, there are things like there's some carbon isotope studies from the Nilgiris, there's some studies of stalactites, you know, there's little bits and pieces here and there. And it looks like there were minor fluctuations. So in the 14th century, it looks like there might have been a slightly higher rainfall, slightly higher rainfall regime than now. Um, the only really clear pattern is in South India during what we usually call the Southern Neolithic, which is about 3000 BC to, you know, about 1000 BC. That was definitely a drier period. There's no question about that. And you had people doing kind of extensive agro-pastoral production, um, growing a lot of millets and other things as well before rice agriculture really got established in the South. But as far as we can tell, and I, you know, this is an open question and I would love to know the answer to it, there do not seem to have been really significant um, changes in rainfall regime, but I mean that's not because there weren't, it's because the evidence is very poor. Okay, that's gotta be the last one. Okay. Nancy Peluso, University of California, Berkeley. Um, I have uh, as much of a comment across times for a conversation across times as for um, uh, a question, but um, you're probably aware that uh, Arun Agarwal and, and Shiva Ramakrishnan have written a really wonderful book uh, on India called Agrarian Environments. And one of the things that is really interesting about the stories that are in that book are the ways that uh, I, uh, ideas of the agrarian and the agrarian environments as being integrated with woodlands and water and watersheds, et cetera, and agriculture has been pulled apart by kind of modern institutional forms that create kind of sectors and, and jurisdictions and so on. And what I was really struck by in your presentation is a, a very similar kind of analysis for a, a completely different period that even looking at the literature and so on that are on these early periods, you've got your, uh, you know, wet rice agriculture in opposition to these forested environments and the, the people that live there and their status and what they eat and all that are also quite quite far apart. And I don't know if, if you've read that particular book or you have a comment on the, on the way these things kind of talk to each other across different periods yeah, of time. Yeah, I mean, and it's not a coincidence, I think. Because, I, you know, I th it's a relatively small community of people interested in environmental issues in South Asia. And the differenti there's a long tradition of agrarian studies, particularly you know, in, in sociology and in, in history. Archaeology is not, you know, except for a few you know, freaks. You know, it's, it's not really part of the story you know, in general, really. Um, but that distinction is, holds true for pretty much all time periods, right? So what Shivi and Arun are talking about is you know, it's, it's, it's equally true for the 6th century as for the 19th century. And I think it's because of consistent, you know, patterns of sort of expectation and training, you know, and that there are particular kinds of intellectual frameworks, you know, and maybe training of historians, Mahesh can help me out here, in terms of thinking about, you know, the relationship between peasants and landscapes and so on. The interest in environment and forests in particular, I mean, it comes really out of colonial history in the last, I don't know, 15 years or so within South Asia. And as I said, there's just a spate of wonderful work, like by Shiva Ramakrishnan, on colonial forestry and the impact of, um, you know, uh, sort of colonial science in general, not just forestry, but forestry is the most well-developed area there. That literature has hardly at all come into sort of discussion or conflict, you know, with people working on things like, um, you know, agriculture, right? Now, why that is, is maybe a peculiar problem to South Asia and not something that, you know, you all need to concern yourself with. But I have to say, I mean, I always thought of my work as on you know, I, I do, you know, paleo environmental analysis and pollen, or, you know, so on, but an environmental impact and agriculture, 
can't say I really thought about it in terms of forests, although you know, forests are going away, forests are coming back. And it was, I have to say, Susanna who insisted you know, to me that uh, you've got to think about this in terms of the larger discussion of forest history. And I, I really minimized the sort of Western got story in the paper, partly because I ran out a little bit of time at the end. Um, but there the picture is, I mean, absolutely fantastic, I think, in the sense that, I mean, it's a similar situation to some of the things that we've been hearing about, that you get the, de the development of a kind of anthropological literature about these, uh, you know, primitive tribes who are the original habit inhabitants of India up in the forest, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out, if you look historically and archaeologically, it turns out there are, you know, polities in the forest, that these people, you know, have states and that they were served in armies and some of the kinds of changes that have led to the development of people as sort of you know seen as primitive and tribal are really recent. So I, I did a um, edited book with Laura Juncker called Forager Traders of South and Southeast Asia in which we tracked this because Southeast Asia is so similar, right? So that you have people who are basically specialists in the extraction of, of you know, what are sometimes called minor forest products, right? Non-timber forest products, especially things like spices and so on. So they get, I mean, I think historically pushed up, in India anyway, they get pushed up land, literally, into the higher elevations of the forests, partly because of demands for spices and the kind of exploitative relationships of exchange, kind of company store sort of things, that keep them, you know, taking in manufactured goods and bringing down spices and, you know, resinous, uh, resins and woods and things. Um, and at the same time, you know, increasing demand for rice, rice is pushing agriculture up the slope. So the forests are, you know, kind of pressure, pressured from that direction as well. So you have people who are basically, you know, occupational specialists, or you know, the professional primitives. I think is, you know, hilarious kind of way of thinking about. It. They're occupational specialists. They're hunter gatherers, you know, by profession. And um, some of them are quite recent, you know, recent entrants to that line of work, right? Um, and so that's changed the, comp the vegetational composition of the forest, of course, right? So that, but then you get a kind of ethnographic moment or a historical moment in which there's a description and you have someone like Fuhrer Heimendorf, say, talking about the Chinchu as, you know, the most primitive tribe in South Asia. They've been exactly the same forever. And, you know, the, the comparison with historical documents is, you know, absolutely staggering. And it's not just people, right? It's the, the physical forest as well, right? that you, there's a kind of, because it has a history and it has changed, there's a kind of or, originating moment when, you know, Western and other you know, well, scholars start to describe it. And that's, you know, the authentic moment after which degradation, you know, sets in. Great, Kathy, thank you. Okay.